Welcome to the Haunted Hacker podcast, February version three. Uh, this is the third one this month. And today we have good friends of mine that uh, are pretty amazing and, and have a spectacular background and, and an awesome company, Odix and uh, Colonel Orrin Eaton and you is Sunshine. So we'll just go ahead and kick it off. Um, so a little bit of news before we start. Uh, I'll be speaking for ICE at some point in time. Um, I'm also speaking at a couple other uh, webcasts and Risk 360 coming up. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Colonel Warren Eaton uh, and his counterpart, Mr. Sunshine. And uh, how are you guys doing today? And thank you for being on the podcast. It's always a pleasure to have you guys on. So, thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, you know, you guys are a friend of the podcast and and uh, I, I always like our conversations. So the reason why we're, we're doing this special version of the podcast uh, today is because of current geopolitical situations and tensions and some of the things that we've seen come out of those situations. Um, you know, Colonel Orrin Eaton was part of the IDF, uh, intimate knowledge of, you know, cyber tactics and, and different things that, that revolve around uh, geopolitical situations and cyber warfare. Um, a lot of people don't understand the fact that the globe has been engaged in cyber warfare for, for many years. Uh, for a lot, it was in the shadows. Um, a lot wasn't disclosed. Uh, we had incidents like Stuxnet. We had incidents where uh, Estonia got attacked. And now just recently, we've seen the Russians using malware and, and ransomware against the Ukrainian government and uh, Ukrainian attackers and, and hacktivists using malware to attack the infrastructure um, of their own country, uh, pretty much to slow down the train system to keep the Russians from coming in. Um, so I'll open up to you, Dr. Uh, Colonel Orton Eaton. Let, let's talk about your view and, and kind of your opinion on how the globe is evolving into this uh, more evident cyber warfare. Yeah, so again, Mike, thanks for having us. Uh, it's our pleasure. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a very good point. And uh, when we look globally and we look at the conflicts around the globe, and you mentioned the invasion of Russia to Estonia was one of the milestones that there was uh, what we call the preliminary cyber attack, you know, prior to the physical forces and all the armed forces. And since then, it seems that the, the cyber warfare took uh, a legit place uh, in conflicts as, you know, as kind of a preliminary act or as an act of you know, in order to, to warn the other side or in order to send signals to the other side, it still, it still seems, you know, that, you know, it's not a shooting weapons. So it's not like a physical destruction, even though you, you can create a lot of damage by, you know, if you uh, stop, or, or control all the traffic lights or all the ship uh, traffic in the harbor and so on. And we were, uh, uh, we experienced and we saw uh, some of these uh, events recently. Yeah, so, absolutely. yeah, so it seems that <clears throat> the cyber uh, attacks and the cyber front had become um, a part of of all conflicts uh, globally, because it, you know, it also allows to kind of taste the water and to see, you know, you start with this, you see the reactions, you see, uh, you feel uh, your enemy, you feel his capabilities, you feel how he can defend himself if, 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 if at all. So what we see now, and we see also in the future, that uh, cyber attacks will no, not only will be the preface for, for the conflict, for the physical theater, but it will take 
also a major role during the uh, the the the, phys the maneuvers and the physical uh, conflict because uh, all the new weapons on the new missiles they are all guided they are all uh, have sort of you know communication uh, back and forth and they are all vulnerable they are all computer based uh, 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 machines and they are all you know all these processes so uh, it will no longer will be only a, a kind of uh, a, a, a first shot or a first blast of the conflict, but it will be also along the, the conflict all the time. And we see it happening in front of our eyes, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for years, though, it's kind of been kind of a in the shadows type, type work. Um, you know, and a lot of people thought that um, the feedback that I got when I made my predictions for this year that we're going to see some geopolitical motivated cyber attacks everybody thought that was doom and gloom and the fact that you know that that's you know a doomsday scenario and it doesn't happen like that um, but i think that people are starting to see that it's real and the reason why I, I focused on that this year is because being in the military and doing signal intelligence we had the electronic warfare capability we had the that signal intelligence capability and it only seemed natural to transition from RF and, and those types of attacks into a more complete and, and devastating attack with cyber because everything is connected now. Uh, and another, uh, I guess, uh, myth that, that people believe and, and they just don't understand is the fact that how could the U.S. be involved in something like that? The U.S. does not do that. <laughs> and After MK Ultra, how could the U.S. government ever dip their hands in anything? They exactly. learned. They learned their lesson. Come on. Exactly. So you know, it's it's really funny when I when I talk to people who are who are you know waving the flag and, and very proud of the fact that their country is just defends themselves and, and defends other people, but they don't understand that in order to not be a victim, in order to not be affected devastationally by those cyber attacks and by those electronic attacks, you have to play the game. You have to not appear weak and vulnerable. So, of course, the U.S. takes part in those, in those activities. And, you know, we're, we're not innocent. We don't have white gloves. You know, we have to participate in order to defend ourselves as well as our uh, assets and interest overseas, um, just with any country. So it's, it's a global affair, and I think people are starting to see that, hopefully. Um, you know, you guys have a, a malware-free file system, right? And the Russians are starting to use ransomware as a weapon. We've, we've heard of it as ransomware as a service, but now we're seeing it used in nation-state attacks. But what are your thoughts on that, and where do you see that going? Um, I mean, I, I personally think that nation-states attacking hospitals and critical infrastructure with ransomware is just as strategic as a military strike. And as Orrin was saying that it, it's in some way a preliminary element today, you know, within the past year and a half, the Iranians attacked the Israeli water supply with the, with the cyber attack. I would say that's beyond a preliminary attack. That's a full-fledged intervention. So I, I think that, that it's on those lines and I think that we have, to, we have to perceive it in that way. It's no longer possible for it to be on the back burner. It's fully fledged and because it's integrating with such vital elements that, that hit not only diverse populations, but when I think about municipalities, I wrote an ebook on municipal cyber risk, they have so many constraints that prevent them from being able to implement an effective strategy against this. And at the same point, they're holding so much valuable data for, for people's, you know, critical, it, it's, it's crazy. So I, I think that having this, this diverse option to just rain devastation, it, it doesn't have to be on, on a level military to military to be able to, to cause a real major impact. Think about the colonial pipeline. If we stop the energy supply, not, it's gonna cause a panic. It's going to increase prices outside of what the reality is. Are we really, are we really in a shortage? No, but but you can see how how over a really short period of time it's making all these KPIs go completely berserk. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think, uh, that, I think uh, 
Yeah, but I think we should make the distinction between, you know, ransomware as a service. Uh, in this case, let's say everyone that have uh, very basic skills can, can get their ransomware as a service, can run it, can operate it and, you know, get some uh, gain out of it and uh, make some benefits for But when you're talking about ransomware as a weapon, uh, then you're talking on a, on a different level, on a state level, on an intelligence uh, uh, entities level. And in this case, uh, we are on a different page. Uh, uh, so it's much more sophisticated. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you need to have also kind of unique tools and technologies in order to protect yourself and be kind of one step ahead of, of this, uh, let's say, state hackers that may, you know, penetrate into your network. So I think, you know, on, on one hand, you know, ransomware as a service become common and many, many, you know, people use it, but it, it's still, let's say it's on a certain level. Uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't devastating and it doesn't cause harm and it doesn't, and people, you know, make money out of it. But it's a different story when you're talking about ransomware as a weapon. And, and, and then it's used in a much more devastating way in, in critical infrastructures and in in way not only to make money, but uh, to get some political points as well. So it's not necessarily making money out of it. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you look at... Uh... Obama, when he, he he was in office, he made the comment that an attack on the infrastructure is an act of war. But yet, we've still seen we've still not seen any kind of motivation or or I guess move towards really considering that and really putting that into effect from the U.S. side. Which I think, if we don't do something soon, if if we don't react to those infrastructure attacks and if we don't actually follow through then we're going to make ourselves a huge target. Um, and I, I think that's unfortunate. But, you know, as we saw Israel dealing with Hamas, I mean, to me, in my mind, that's the correct way to do it. You lay down the line, you say, hey, look, our infrastructure is part of how we survive. You attack that, that's an act of war. So I think we're going to see eventually that line being drawn globally. And we're going to start seeing that that encroachment and the reaction, as we saw with Hamas. Um, I, I but, hope but, that doesn't so happen. I, 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 I'd like Go to ahead. ask you a question here. Do you think that there's going to be a change in the ideas of humanitarian law and cybercrime being able to to be seen on the level of you know uh, uh, crime against humanity? where you could create something on such a scale in the digital universe that, that it could cause this destruction similar to, to what we've seen in, in cleansing or something that could cause such destruction to critical infrastructure that devastates a country and causes this panic. Absolutely. I mean, when you look back at Chernobyl, right? So Chernobyl was a very unfortunate situation. Um, but can you imagine something like that being spurred by a cyber attack from a nation state? You know, at that point, I think we're going to have to sit back and say, okay, we've looked at this and, and we've seen it as an act of war um, and you've devastated our infrastructure or you've killed X amount of people with your cyber attack. And I think at that point, we'd be forced to look at it as a humanitarian attack and, and take you know, measures to, to combat it. Um, but I think that a, a lot of people or a lot of countries are afraid to take that step because they still see cyber as you know, a convenience or, or the way that we live our lives. And I don't think they really see it as something that we need to protect to that extent. And the U.S., I think, is, is guilty of that vision of uh, the, cyber, the cyber world and the, the cyber warfare theater. Um, what are your thoughts on that as far as, you know, at what point do we converge and say, okay, from now on, this is what's going to happen? I think... Um... Globally, uh, not only the U.S., but other countries think the same, that, you know, a cyber attack on critical infrastructure, it's really a signal for an active war. 
The problem, however, is that sometimes when you experience a cyber attack, you not always know the source of this cyber attack. So let's say that your train system was hacked and you say, well, this is my critical infrastructure. I decide this is a, an active war, but against who? Who, who initiated this attack? And, you know, uh, it's not that, you know, if some, if Hamas shoots some missiles on Israel, so we know it's from there, we can 100% 100 sure that it was shot from the Gaza Strip and we know how to retaliate. But if a cyber attack happens, uh, we can know and we can trace back, but sometimes it's not 100% sure. If the attack was built in a way, sometimes it's a little bit difficult, sometimes maybe confusing. So uh, I think the, the declaration is there and is right, as long as you know the real source of, of these cyber attacks. Once you know that if the US knows that someone, you know, attack with a cyber attack, one of their critical infrastructure, and 400% know who was this guy, it's, it's a war. It's an active war. I'm abs absolutely, I'm, I'm sure they will retaliate in uh, the most powerful way. Yeah. I wonder what the stomach is, though, because we, we saw that there was, there was an attack on Afghanistan that, that killed civilians. That was, there was an intention, there, there was critical loss. I wonder, as people see that cyber threats are growing, if there's going to be more of a stomach to say, we need to take occasionally broader strokes to protect ourselves. And I'm not sure if everybody's willing to, to make that risk and say, okay, there's going to be a group that we're going to hold accountable that, that might have the hammer of, of one of these major governments. It's difficult to say, but then at the same point, I think if we make that, that parable to, to military intervention, the governments are no, have no problem kind of checking that box and saying there's going to be somebody that's going to be lost in that gray area, and we just have to make that sacrifice. So I think it's, it's difficult to make that, that philosophical decision, but it's going to be something that's going to come more into the forefront what are we going to sacrifice to be able to protect ourselves from this cyber risk? Absolutely. And I think that another factor that plays into it as well. So in the U.S., the, we kind of base political decisions and, and activities, you know, as far as military response based on the country's temperament and, and the thoughts of the people. So, so here's the problem that we face in the U.S. is the fact that a lot of people don't understand that level. They, they don't understand the, the kinetics. They don't understand the activity of, you know, using infrastructure against us uh, by cyber means. Um, and that, you know, that it's unfortunate, but there's a lot of uh, uneducated people when it comes to that, that principle, right? And so to get the, the backing or, or the country's, uh, you know, opinion in that way to, to make those, uh, I guess, fronts and, and to attack you know, based on a cyber attack is going to be very difficult. And then you take a look at leadership in the U.S. and, and what we've dealt with over the past four years and the chaos that's ensued and, and the tensions here just domestically. Uh, that raises another question. You know, do we have the, the people's vote? Do we have the trust of the people to take those actions? And I would say right now we're at a really vulnerable state in the U.S. because of our political tensions and because of the distrust for the government and any act of war based on cyber attack, I think would raise a lot of questions. And I think the first time that we do that, I think it's gonna cause a lot of problems. But if we don't do it soon, and if we don't do it systematically, then I think we're gonna become a target of a lot of nation states. And I've even seen, so last year I did a lot of incident response on ransomware, several, I did 13 in like 60 days. And one of them was very, very interesting to the fact where we knew who the, the ransomware attackers were and the type of ransomware that was used. But what was interesting was in that same environment, we identified an APT. So it was like they were working together hand in hand. You had the ransomware gangs trying to ransom and get money. But in the background, you had the APT that was sitting quietly and probably collecting intelligence. Um, so we start, we're starting to see that, that collaboration between nation state and government and ransomware gangs. 
And it's a natural progression because why not take advantage of those gangs and, and that, that criminal activity to carry out your own espionage, right? And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. For sure. I mean, I, I, think, that, I think it's interesting as that, that third wall breaks down, it's, it's very logical to see these relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that... The, it's also the cost of entry, just like how ransomware is a service. There, there's so much that, that needs to go in on the front end to be able to effectively do it. Governments who want to be able to come into this game and say, we have the budget. We have, we have this oil revenue that we would like to spend on this political X. It's very easy to approach one of the ransomware gangs and use this as leverage versus creating the domestic capabilities. But I think what some of the, the larger nation states, especially the United States are doing, is saying we need to create these homegrown capabilities. We need to create the professionals. And you know we need to create the, the private enterprise. I see in Israel, we get blasted for it, especially recently. But I think that it's because cyber products are being missed miscategorized if you categorize an nso product as something that's a military weapon you know nobody has a problem selling out bullets and last time i checked bullets aren't to make friends so right. maybe i'm wrong i don't know i'm from baltimore so i don't know but it it, it just seems that that this miscategorization of what cybersecurity is and what cyber products can do if we can if we can realign it, we can change this consciousness and then kind of make it into something where cybersecurity is security is your lifeblood. Instead of it being the, this highly technical thing, it's we're going to turn off the ventilator in your hospital. We're going to make your highway not work. We're going to make it that the the your car is going to be taken. Your Tesla, unfortunately, is ours. And I think that when it becomes Put into context, it's a lot easier for the general population to understand the risk and then to be able to, to see its, its, you know, its impact on the field. Oh, absolutely. And when you look at uh, just recently in the news in the U.S., the, the big talk is about Pegasus malware, right? Um, right. The NSO group, you know, we all know that they're very highly skilled and, and this, this malware has made its rounds around the globe. And of course, they blame the NSO group now for everything that happens with Pegasus malware. And they're blaming it, you know, they're, they're accusing the government of using Pegasus, which I'm pretty sure that they are. Uh, but again, that's one of those pieces of malware that, that is weaponized. And, you know, every country uses it now. But, you know, of course, the blame gets put on NSO group for their, their creation of it. But really, I mean, we're all kind of guilty because every government's using it now. And I, I think it's unfortunate that we take something that, that is that highly skilled and that I mean, I looked at the code, and the code's beautiful. And I, I have a lot of respect for, for what they've done with that. Um, but then you take other countries' view of it, and even the U.S.'s view, and they blame NSO, but yet they turn around and we find them using it against citizens. You know, it, 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 it shocks me that they would use weaponry like that that could be used to combat global cyber terrorism, and they use it against their own people. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more of that here in the U.S., uh, the big tech using government level uh, malware and capabilities to collect on their own people instead of being focused on defending the country and going and combating that type of evil. There has been internal response to that as well from Google, from Amazon, from the employees mm -hmm. saying that. Where are we going to draw this line? And Oren has written about it in Forbes that, you know, who's going to be the driving forces of morality and ethics and cybersecurity and who's going to be able to, to assume, is this a freedom fighter, a political dissident, a rebel, or a constitutional hero? And it's all up for grabs. And, uh, you know, I think that, that we can see in the military and the cyber field that based off of that distinction, you make calculated decisions and how you're going to use it and execute it is, is, is something that's very complex. And, and Pegasus might be the, the weapon of choice now, but it's the weapon of choice because it's, it's precise and it can effectively collect this data. It's no different than, than anything else in the next product that's going to replace it. It's how are we viewing it and who is going to be having this conversation of who we target. Exactly. I think, uh... With the, with the Pegasus, first of all, you know, the government of Israel really controls uh, any cyber attacks tool and cyber offense tools. I mean, it's not a free export all over the world, like some other products that the U.S. has some export controls and Israel has export control. 
And I still believe that over 95% of the usage of Pegasus was for good cause. I mean, to catch terrorists and to catch uh, criminals and uh, to go after uh, national security issues and stuff like this. In most of the countries that got it, but it always go to the headlines when you have, you know, the, the 1% that people misused it. And in this case, we are in, in, in deep trouble because when, when the police, and by the way, now in Israel, they claim that the Israel police uh, went after civilians, but now they just took back and maybe it's not correct because it was some of the journalists that published it, but there's no evidence whatsoever. So it may be some noise, you know, just a, a noisy environment, but anyway, it's a signal. It's a signal that this is weapon. And when you have a weapon in your hand, you need to know how to use it and against who to use it and against not uh, to use it. And this is very, very sensitive issue. And uh, I think that globally should be uh, more uh, control over these uh, tools because, you know, it's, it's enough that, that one time you get to the wrong hands and they, they can do a, a substantial damage to everyone to the, the community. So uh, it should be controlled. It should be uh, globally controlled uh, in order that this weapon won't fall to, you know, hands that you really don't want to have it over there. Absolutely. And when you look at uh, China and, and the Olympics that are going on right now, uh, there was an app that was kind of, you know, the foc focal point of security and do we really trust this app? And, and they were, you know, instructing athletes and people attending to download this app, uh, you know, from a Chinese developer. Of course, the Olympics is in that country. So why would it be anything other than a Chinese application, right? So, but the FBI looked at it and said, you know, athletes and people who are attending, please take a burner phone. You know, we're not sure about this application. There's been a lot of research into it. And some people say, you know, it's collecting data on people attending the games and, and stuff like that. Um, what are your thoughts on that application, the validity and potential risk of that app? Well, the, <laughs> well, we we don't know much about you know what's going on in China. Uh, it's a kind of a, a huge country that runs its own laws and the, and goes on its own way. And it's not always, uh, you know, like we are familiar and aware in the West. So uh, uh, they're doing a lot of things in China and Russia that, you know, sometimes violates human rights. And, you know, everyone knows it. And uh, I know that the US and other countries try to change it try to uh, uh, struggle against it and not always, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of sanctions on Russia and, uh, but it, it, it won't, it won't bother them. And uh, so I think that uh, when you say that there is a global effort, uh, it, it's the global efforts, it's for the countries that really have kind of uh, uh, a, a statement between them, the way they want to control their lives, the way they want to live in democracy and, and other way of life. Um, and, you know, some, some countries, maybe also some, you know, other tribes, countries and so on, they, they're not uh, really ready uh, to join to this effort because this is really needs it's a trust between countries and uh, you need to build this trust uh, and it can be broken very easily you know one event and it's broken so uh, 
it's a really challenge. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and especially with you know technology that comes out of China, there's been so many uh, arguments to pull technical advancements. You know that the U.S. is making inside the the walls of China to ex, you know bring it back home and stuff like that. But I don't think that's the answer, uh, and probably not the best effect with diplomacy either. Um, you know, so the U.S. is is really looking at, at Russia right now and their advancement against Ukraine. And, you know, of course, they have talked about, you know, deploying troops. They've started that, that idea of pushing people, you know, troops over to that, that region, but not specifically to the Ukraine. Um, and it, it's a very, very unstable situation when it comes to mm-hmm. diplomacy and, and, and protecting different countries. Um, and I think that when we do see you know, if, if it happens, if Russia does cross the border into the Ukraine, uh, which, I mean, there's, there's intelligence now that, that it's already starting to happen. Um, I think we're going to see an uptick in cyber. I think that, you know, the, the invasion is also going to bring on a lot of cyber activity. And, and Russia had plainly stated that if the U.S. intervened in that process, that they would target our critical infrastructure. And to me, that 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 really, you know, sounds an alarm. And it's like, you know, do, do you really want to cross that line? You know, and it 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 kind of shocked me that they would even make that statement if they made that statement. It, it's Russia. Mm-hmm. Do you, does Russia need to make this statement? It's not like right. they're they're going to send over chocolate milk. Like right. I've heard of them in the past. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and and it, people were shocked here. Like, oh my God, they're threatening our infrastructure. I'm like, they threaten our infrastructure daily. You know, if, if you look at all of the red states, um, you know, as far as like uh, the communist countries, uh, Cuba, for example, you know, has been recently caught in our infrastructure probing around. Uh, you know, my, my theory is these countries have all been in the infrastructure. They've all planted their kill switches. Um, but again, hitting that nuclear cyber button is just like hitting the nuke button in real life um, and, and physical in the physical world. Because once you hit that button and take down somebody's you know, critical infrastructure to the point where they throw us back 30 years, I think we're, we're on that precipice of a global, I guess a global world war when it comes That's to cyber. Mutually assured destruction. I mean, it, for China, the Chinese economy is so intertwined with, with America. I, mm-hmm. I have a many years in like Chinese, Chinese policy background before my time at Odex. And it's, you know, as much as, as you see that threat and that, and that posturing, does it make sense for China to cut off all the manufacturing to the States? You know, like, does, does it make like they, this needs to go to a market and the Belt and Road has an idea where we're going to export this excess manufacturing and X, Y, and Z, but you need this player to be strong and for the American economy to be strong and to be resilient for mm-hmm. you to, to have the, this balance and this complementarity. If you, if you see it as, as this pure offensive foe, it, it doesn't work. And we see like um, Nixon engaging with, with, uh, with China, mm-hmm. all this economic collaboration, we can find a way to come over our political divides. Right. We can we can throw Russia under the boat. We could do whatever is necessary, but in the end, it's what's going to be most beneficial for our bottom line. And I think that if if America was more politically and economically intertwined with Russia, there wouldn't be this tension. You see in Europe, because the gas lines are coming from Russia into mainland Europe, there's mm-hmm. a lot more, you know, shadow stepping. How are we going to to make a political compromise versus America. I believe they've already bought Alaska. There's not so much on the plate. Where are we going to connect? And it, you can see how this makes impl- in, impact across the board. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And then you look at, you know, just recently on the same lines of China, you, you look recently where the uh, North Koreans launched a hypersonic missile and a series of missiles. And then the story came out that they're, their internet connection, egress and ingress, had been pretty much shut down. And then the story evolves into this guy who, you know, was upset about some North Korean hackers that, that stole some of his data, and he alone shut down their internet connection. And that came out of the U.S. And I, I, 
I was sitting there thinking, you know, I did a poll on LinkedIn. I said, you know, who do you think is responsible for the North Korean attack where they shut down the internet to their, their core? And everybody had their own ideas, you know, oh, it's probably a power failure. You know, somebody probably, you know, messed something up and, and there's misconfiguration. And then there were some people who said, you know, probably U.S. and five eyes. But then the U.S. came out after that and said, well, it's this one guy. We're not really sure who he is, but he took down the entire North Korean, you know, government internet uh, because he was upset. And I, I'm not sure if I buy that rhetoric. I, I don't know if I buy that story. To try no. and embarrass the, the North Korea. I mean, it, it shows more for their political prowess that they don't need to take down the North Koreans. Some some jerk with a laptop watching Squid Games can can make it work. But I think that that we know that you know the the budgets they're not they're not spending it on, on you know on agriculture. They're spending it on some basic level of cyber defense that you would need you would need something more substantial than somebody with a with a gripe. Right, exactly. And that was my thoughts. It, it was really convenient how the story came out. The man wasn't named. And basically, it was one guy sitting at home. It was like, it was like a slap in the face to North Korea. Like, you know, if he, if he can do it, anybody can do it. And, and this, is, this is connected to what I said previously about the source of the attack. So assume that the U.S. government would admit that they did it and they actually shut down the Internet. It's maybe for the North Korean, it's a, it's a cause to start a, a war. I mean, it's a active war. And maybe they will start launching missiles to the US or whatever. But now when, you know, it's in the dawn and nobody knows exactly who was the guy and who stands behind him. And you, you cannot say 100%. So uh, it just... You leave it in there, so it's 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 left open. Yeah, it's it's that cat and mouse game that, that the U.S. has always played, that cloak and dagger espionage where, you know, they, they hire a group or they hire an individual to carry something out. You know, we've, we've been really effective when it comes to overthrowing governments through coup, uh, and it's not been traced back. Um, the CIA is pretty infamous at doing stuff like that. And also, you know, the leaking of tools that, that the government uses, you know, like we saw the, the stuff being leaked, like Weeping Angel and stuff like that into, you know, realms like the shadow brokers and, and you know, online, you know, dark web brokers uh, for those tools. And when that happened years ago, I thought, you know, it's really convenient that it was leaked into these people's hands and disseminated around the world. Um, it almost seemed like an intentional leak. And they blamed it on a contractor who had gone kind of rogue and then dumped it into the dark web. But I, I think that, you know, a lot of countries are in that business of throwing those tools out there into specific people because they know who those tools will be used against. Well, it's also so. the ultimate equalizer where mm -hmm. in, in countries where you don't have the, the budget, you don't have... The, the large scale military industrial complex to be able to provide for this war. You just need some smart, dedicated people with a problem and a desire to get out of there to really motivate them to, to make a significant impact. And I think that that's something that, that it, it's, it's almost like the American dream. Anybody could take down your adversary. All you need is just, you know, the, the skills and it's a very scary thought that, that if you put the time in and you get connected to, to these hacker groups and, and build up the, the gravitas, you could, you could do this. You could be the guy who takes down North Korea. Yeah, exactly. And that's a scary thought because at that point, everything that we've talked about as far as like, you know, critical infrastructure and, and hitting hospitals and, and killing mass numbers of people, that could be in the hands of, of a group in Nigeria or, you know, even in the U.S., um, you know, it, and we can't control that. And I think that at some point, the world is going to have to sit back and say, look, cybersecurity and cyber threat is a global issue. No longer can we prosecute in specific countries and, and in specific courts. I think we're going to end up needing something like a global court where we, where we have those laws on a global scale. And we set that precedence of you do this, this is what's going to happen. And this is supported by every country that's part of the connected internet. Um, I don't know how, what it's going to take to get to that point, but as you know, a hacker. The, for the International Criminal Court, you know, we're talking about prosecuting people for war crimes. And I spent mm -hmm. a bunch of time in The Hague 
And not only is the, the court very flawed intrinsically, but trying to get jurisdiction and trying to get America, Russia, China to, to join it is, is almost impossible. So to think of that we're going to integrate something like, a, you know, the, the red alerts from, from the international police and then somebody is going to hold it accountable. Because what we keep on saying is these groups keep on going back and forth from mm -hmm. where are they valuable in the, the legal sphere for the government versus when are they a rogue player. And I think that that's what's really tricky, that you can't, you can't say that they're on one side of the law because until we can know what a terrorist is, what a freedom fighter is, what it, what's the what's the future leader of this country versus somebody who's a you know a, a digital tyrant, it's very very difficult to to lay down the law. Yeah, and it's it's really convenient too the way that we have the, you know cyber law constructed in, in countries that prosecute and those that don't, and it's funny because as a hacker we will choose where we launch our attacks from based on those mm -hmm. laws. You know, if, if I know that I can get away with an attack on, you know, North Korea from the U.S., that's where I'm going to commit that crime. If, you know, I want to attack the U.S., of course, I'm going to go to a Russian network, you know, because you have that protection. Um, right. And I think the attackers are getting smarter when it comes to launching those specific attacks against countries. Um, they're looking at the laws, they're studying the law and the prosecution and the presence has been set in those countries. They're getting smarter about it. Um, and I think that's a real problem as well. So, yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think it's fascinating when, when you see, I think that there's this idea of hackers wearing sweatshirts in basements, um, you know, and not this, this perception that they're very, very intelligent. If you're looking up the law and trying to, to mitigate your criminal accountability, or you're taking this deeper philosophical approach and you're working with nation states, and it, it's very, very complex. And I think that we need to change our idea of, of who these people are, what their, what their ambitions are, what they're looking for, and what's, what's the long game. You know, it, it's not just this financial motivation and the the background that can lead people into into illicit cyber crime is, is very very nuanced and not so different than you know the the military cyber hero who's going to be guiding our defense. Yeah, and you, you look at the orange man from the U.S. that that was president for a while, and during the debates, he identified and described hackers as four hundred pounds in their in their mom's basement sitting behind a computer and that is so inaccurate and i think the media and government you know portrays the hackers as you know the, these these guys who have no life and, and whatnot one's um, not more than 350 pounds for instance <laughs> so i think that it's it's really it's not a fair judgment myself right. i'm 365 but you know it's we, we still have to be fair right exactly yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah and when i heard that i was sitting in a hotel room i was actually doing a a pen test uh, on site for a company and I was watching the debates when he said that I thought you know minimizing the idea and the identity of these these pe these skilled people is probably the biggest mistake you can make because then the people hear that and they take that in and they're like oh we're not worried about hackers because there's some kid you know in somebody's basement that's trying to cause trouble and I think on the global stage that identity and, and that persona does not resonate at all um, most skilled hackers are, are business people, you know, they're PhDs, you know, they, they have some sort of super intelligence when it comes to diagnosing and, and looking at the world as a whole. And I think as defense, you know, in the U S I don't think that that companies here take into account geopolitics. And that's why I focused on that this year is because geopolitics plays a huge part in cybercrime, a huge part, not just, you know, financial motivations by those, you know, countries, but also, you know, the politics between countries and the politics between groups and, and, and malware creation, you know, geopolitics plays a part in everything that we do in cyber, but nobody re really pays attention to looking at that political tension, analyzing it and learning the actors and trying to find ways to mitigate based on the information intelligence you get from that. So hopefully the world can, can change in that aspect and really realize that, Geopolitics drives a lot of what we see in every industry, whether it's banking, whether it's defense or, or even cybersecurity, geopolitics is evident and it's a foundation of everything we do. So tell me about Odix and, and what Odix is doing now. And, you know, it's been close to about seven or eight months since I spoke to you guys. Um, a lot's happened, right. I'm sure. So catch me up. 
Yeah, we are. Uh, in fact, you know, when when we saw that most of the world and the the uh, application go to the cloud and to the SaaS applications, uh, we realized that. You know, there's a lot of, you know, collaboration apps and a lot of file transfer apps and they're all SaaS, but all the, the current, you know, on-prem solutions, they are not suitable for this application. So uh, in, my, in my vision is that we will be the, the industry standard for the SaaS application to protect all file transfer and file collaboration, all these things. We started with a firewall for Microsoft 365 Exchange Online, mm -hmm. which works very well. And uh, we see a lot of traction. We work in particular with the distributors and the resellers of Microsoft 365. And in fact, they bundle a firewall with the 365. There is a very nice blog on a Microsoft website about how Microsoft and Firewall and Audix protect the 365 users. So uh, we have uh, a lot of customers so far satisfied with several, you know, case studies that they, you know, we were able to create uh, uh, a single click deployment product with, uh, you know, uh, not, 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 not really nothing, not effort for, you know, maintenance support. And it goes like that, very smooth, uh, frictionless, uh, seamlessly. And th this is what the, the service provider like. They like to see how they can make money without, you know, friction and without, you know, uh, spending a lot of time. Uh, so, uh, it's very easy to explain our added value that we provide to the Microsoft uh, 365 security, either to the Defender, to the EOP, we provide, we complement the Microsoft 365 solution. So we don't claim to, uh, uh, you know, take out Microsoft or we don't claim that, you know, we, we have any conflict with the, their security, but we complement their solution in order to have a really uh, uh, a nice secured solution, uh, in particular against ransomware that resides within files and goes goes you know sometimes many levels down in nested files and most of the the tools today are not able to uh, go after this. But since we are doing a real kind of deep file analysis and break the files and look after everything that's moving inside and uh, uh, that is suspicious. So we are able to track these attacks that are multi-level and uh, nested files attacks and, and all this, which today are very common. And hackers also look at this domain as, as well. So. Uh, we really reduced the attack surface significantly uh, for the 365 users. So, yeah, we're moving forward, and uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. Our our next product to release is uh, the solution for Teams, because we see a lot of usage for collaborations tools and so on. So Teams is definitely the next candidate that we will provide a solution. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I've been following you guys quite a bit, and uh, the the relationship with Microsoft is huge. Um, you know, I, I was really happy to see that, that you guys were, were going that route. Um, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, and as, as usual, and a really great conversation. And I think that when people see this podcast or listen to this podcast, it'll open some eyes and maybe bring some awareness to, you know, things that they didn't take into consideration uh, and maybe look at mm -hmm. their own company and their own operations and, and kind of, you know, follow, follow along. Um, I wish you guys the best of luck and, and please stay in touch. I'm sure that we'll uh, have you back on soon um, and good luck. And I appreciate Thank you guys. You being very on. much. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you, man. Cheers. Bye now. Cheers.